If you have your Bibles, um, I want to turn to Acts 26. I'm going to actually read the entire chapter this morning because God tells it much better than I do uh, in His Word. But chapter 25 is uh, the chapter of Paul's trial before Festus. And um, <clears throat> we have there the same charges by the Jewish leaders that uh, they had brought before, charges of uh, heresy and sacrilege and treason. Uh, Festus knows that Paul is innocent, um, but he wants to do the Jews a favor. I started to title today's sermon, uh, Let Me Do You a Favor, because that's the attitude of Festus, uh, in an effort to please the Jews, he goes against conscience and against what he knows to be fact um, because uh, he wants to keep them happy. He knows of the plot that, uh, to kill Paul as he sends him back to Jerusalem and uh, the plot the Jews have to kill Paul along the way. And so at the end of... Uh, of that chapter, uh, Paul appeals uh, to Caesar. As a Roman citizen, he had that right. He stood before um, Caesar's court, that is, with Festus, but if he didn't like what Festus decided, as a Roman citizen, he had the right to appeal to Caesar to go to Rome and be tried in front of the emperor himself. Now, in the vignette that we are going to look at today in chapter 26, King Agrippa has shown up to pay tribute to Festus as he comes to power there. Uh, this is Herod Agrippa II. Uh, he would be the last of the great Herods. And he was king or ruler in northern Galilee. He had several Galilean towns that he, um, that he ruled. Uh, but he comes to Caesarea to pay tribute to Festus. And so when he comes, Festus decides to bring Paul out and let Paul make his defense in front of King Agrippa and his wife uh, Bernice. Uh, Bernice, by the way, was also his sister, uh, and so that tells you enough about that relationship right there. He had married his own sister. So as we come to chapter 26, Paul is standing in front of King Agrippa, and rather than kind of telling you about that, I thought it would be much better for the Lord himself to give us the word that he had written through Luke uh, for chapter 26. And so let's stand because we believe and we teach that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, our only rule of faith and practice, inerrant in all that it teaches and affirms. And so <clears throat> follow along with me, if you would, as I read this chapter. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hands and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jews all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child. From the very beginning of my life, in my own country, and also in Jerusalem, they have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O king, it is because of this hope 
that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my boat against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme in my uh, obsession against them. I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. On one of the journeys I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. About noon, O king, I was on the road and I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. And we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I then asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, o, uh, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. For to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Ju Judah, and to Ju the Gentiles also I preached, that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. This is why the Jews seized me in the temple, of, temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses would have hap uh, said would have happened, that the Christ would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your learning has, is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, he, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things. And I speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And King, then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for the chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. They left the room, and while talking to one another, they said, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Lord, bless <clears throat> this long reading and the hearing of this, your word. May your spirit be bold in it, but may we see no man save the Lord Jesus Christ only, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Thank you for bearing with me in that. <clears throat> Paul, from the very beginning in chapter 26, appeals to the king's knowledge and his sense of fair play. He says, listen to me patiently. Do you ever wonder why in the providence of God, Paul, who had done nothing wrong, appealed to Caesar? If he could have actually been freed, what might have happened? And yet we know that it was in God's plan that he would go to Rome. 
and there have great impact even though he was imprisoned. So as he talks to uh, King Agrippa here, in verses 4 through 8, Paul talks about the fact that what he's preaching is the Bible, is orthodoxy. He's saying, look, what I am preaching is nothing more than what the Old Testament prophets preached. He says, if you look at the Old Testament, the one that is foretold, the Messiah, is the one in whom I am preaching. He is defending there, that is, the Jewish fathers and prophets who had died for this very cause of Jesus Christ. I find this argument this week as we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, I find this particularly compelling. I recall that Bloody Mary, who ruled England, killed over 300 Protestants, burned over 300 Protestants during her reign as an example of people who thought they were Christians, that is, the Catholics of that day, were doing to people who were Christians, that is, the Protestants of that day. Now, let me quickly say that Protestants killed Catholics as well. Right? Those who thought that they were defending orthodoxy persecuted those who had seen the fulfillment of that orthodoxy. And here, Paul is being persecuted and tried because he is simply preaching the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Remember, the Old Testament is Jesus concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. And we could go to Fox's Book of Martyrs and see the lives of the very people that, are, that were actually burned for preaching and teaching exactly as Paul is doing it here. If we had time, we could talk about little Father Bilney, who was one of the first to burn in 1531, or Hugh Latimer, or Nicholas Ridley, who were burned together, or John Lambert, who was horribly executed and burned, or even William Tyndale, who was... Uh, strangled for preaching the gospel. So here the Jews have plotted to kill Paul for preaching the fulfillment of what their glorious prophets had so willingly died for. In verses 9 through 11, <clears throat> we have his history of persecuting the bride of Christ. He talks about how he went from synagogue to synagogue, how he cast his own vote to kill Christians, how he even got letters and went to foreign cities to persecute Christians. And then in verses 12 through 18, we have the third recount by Luke of Paul's conversion. Now, this is fascinating that Luke would take the time in this book to talk about Paul's conversion on three different occasions. He talks about it when it actually happened. He mentioned it again, as Paul does in one of his defenses. And then here we get probably the broadest um, uh, wording of his conversion here in front of Agrippa. Notice in verse 13, about noon, O king, I was on the road and I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. That takes us back, doesn't it, to the perhaps the transfiguration where Christ became radiant, whiter than anything Peter could describe. And here that that same Shekinah glory, that same brightness knocks everyone off their horse to the ground as Christ calls out. And notice, notice in this particular description that Jesus speaks to him in Aramaic, in his own language, and 
calls him by name. Have you ever thought about Jesus knowing your name? He does. He knows everything about you. And the intimacy of that relationship that you have with your Savior is shown here as Christ cries out, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? We get that fantastic statement, is it hard for you to kick against the goads? Now, remember, goads were sharp poles with, with iron uh, points on the end that uh, prodded the oxen to go along, and as a, a willing ox uh, didn't have to get prodded very much to go in the right direction, but every once in a while we get a rebellious ox who would kick against the goads and only do more damage to himself than, uh, and, and inflict more pain and not get anywhere. And so Jesus is saying, look, why are you um, resisting? <clears throat> why are you uselessly resisting me? And then we get to the heart of the passage in verse 19. Notice what Paul says to the king. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. I would say that that wording, that sentence, is one that all of us wish <clears throat> that we would be able to say when we come face to face with our Savior one day. In fact, this is, this is where Luther stood. When we, in Sunday school this morning, if you were listening to the video, and we talk about Luther's, um, you know, I, give me 24 hours to think about recanting, right? But then he comes back out and he says, uh, you know, here I stand, I, I can do no other. It's, it's not right to go against conscience or the word of God. This is where Luther stood. The vision from heaven that had come to him in, through reading God's word, he stood there and he could not be disobedient to it. This is where Bilney and Ridley and Latimer and Tyndale and Lambert all stood. They accepted the fires of burning alive over being disobedient to the vision that God had given them. Will you be able to say this one day? Will you be able to look at your Savior in the face as that radiant Shekinah glory illuminates all around? <clears throat> and will you be able to say to Him, I was not disobedient to the vision that you gave me, to the calling on my life that you gave me? pray that each of you will be able to say that. The cares of this world would not drive you away from the high calling in Christ Jesus. And then we come over to verse 24 where Festus is not as patient as Agrippa is and interrupts him. And then in verse 25, Paul says, Look, what I am teaching you is true and reasonable. Here uh, we, we get the basis for the apologetic of the Christian faith. It is true and it is reasonable. It is logical. You don't have to make great leaps of blind faith to accept the gospel. It is reasonable and it is true. And then we come in verses 28 through 32 to what I believe is some of the saddest language in all of Scripture. It is a statement that haunts me as I talk about Jesus to others. 
Verse 28, King Agrippa says to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? The king was almost persuaded, but not quite. What was it that was holding him back? Was it his position? Was it his past sins? Was it intellectual? Was it spiritual? Was it emotional? I ask you today, and, and this, is, this is what I, I talked about for those of you who perhaps weren't there for Bridges of Hope. Are you playing with God? Right, so you might think that it's true and reasonable in your mind, but has your heart been animated with the hope of the gospel? Do you still have that heart of stone, or do you now have a heart of flesh? Have you come to that saving relationship with Jesus? Are you, are you almost there, but something is just holding you back? I would ask you this day to come across that chasm of sin into a full-fledged relationship with Jesus Christ. Let that gospel invade all aspects of your life. The king, I'm sure, perhaps persuaded from an intellectual standpoint, but he couldn't let the gospel interfere with his real job, right? And so many of us are like that. We can't we, we want to be there on Sunday. We want to worship, but we can't let the gospel right come into our business or come into our marriage or come into our playtime or our recreation time. After all, those things are important too, right? I'm begging you today to not be like Agrippa. Come fully into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Look what Paul says. I don't care whether it's a short time or a long time. I pray that to God, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for the change. In other words, become a child of the King. Paul says, I don't wish any of you to be in chains, to be persecuted, but I do wish that you would see the truth and reasonableness of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. For Paul knows that nothing less can satisfy. He has tasted heaven. Remember, he was called up to the third heaven. He has, he has tasted heaven and, and he knows that it is the ultimate answer. I want to close this morning with the words of Father Bilney on the night in which he was, the night before he was to be burned to death alive in 1531. <clears throat> Listen to these words from a man who knows that the next day his body is going to be set on fire all he has to do is say, I recant, and he'll be freed. In fact, he has once already and was so upset with himself that he had recanted that, that now he stands firm in the gospel. Listen to these words. It's, and the scene is he's seated at a table with his his followers around him, the room lit only by a single candle that burns on the middle of the table. And there, Bilney says these words as he, in fact, stuck his finger into the flame of the candle. Though the fire should be of great heat to my body, 
yet the comfort of God's Spirit should cool me, should cool it to my everlasting refreshing. At this point, Bilney put his hand towards the flame of the candle burning before them, and feeling the heat, said, Oh, I feel by experience and have known it long by philosophy that fire by God's ordinance is naturally hot. But I am persuaded by God's holy word and by experience of some spoken of in the same. And in the fire, they felt no consumption. And I am constantly believing whatsoever the stubble of this my body shall be wasted by it, yet my soul and spirit shall be purged thereby. A pain for a time whereupon notwithstanding followeth joy unspeakable. And Bilney then quoted, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he hath formed thee. O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee and called thee by name, and thou art mine. And when thou goest through the water, I will be with thee. And the strong flood shall not overflow thee. And though thou walkest in the fire, it shall not burn thee. And the flame shall not, be, shall not kindle thee, for I am the Lord your God. Will you be able to say, I have not been disobedient to the call of my life? You are not threatened with being burned alive. At least not yet. And yet, will you allow the, the pleasures and the sins of this life to make you disobedient to that high calling that others have seen and walked humbly into the flame? What is keeping you today from obeying the call of God in your life? If you haven't come to Christ, today is the day. If you are a believer, but have yet, not yet surrendered wholly to Him as Lord of your life, I ask you today to examine those things which keep you from obeying the heavenly vision that is found for your life here. And to let it so animate you that you with Bill Me can say, pain for a little while here on earth. I didn't get to go do that on Sunday. I went to church. I didn't get to that promotion because I talked about Jesus. I wasn't willing to turn my blind, a blind eye to sin and I lost my job for Jesus. I lost a relationship with a friend because I wasn't willing to sacrifice the principles of Scripture. Oh, the pain of that right now, but it will be followed by joy unspeakable. Folks, don't play with God. Fully surrender. Be obedient to the vision. Amen.